Okay, so then we might, we, I think we have a time for the vertebrae. Now this is the vertebral column. So again, you have all these vertebrae. So you have seven vertebrae in the cervix, cervical area. So these are the major regions of the vertebral column or aka, AKA your spinal column. So you have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar. Hey, you have your anatomical landmarks, right? Then you have your sacral and the coccygeal. And sacral is actually fused. So they're not separate like the vertebrae in your cervical, thoracic, and lumbar regions. They're all fused into the sacrum. And the coccyx, this is actually four vertebrae. So when you're developing in the womb, these were actually s separate at first. But during fetal development, these end up fusing. So this is my favorite mnemonic. Breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, and dinner at 5. So I like it. Not only does it only tell you, and even if you eat, eat at different times, just for the sake of mnemo this mnemo mnemonic, breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, dinner at 5. So it tells you in order. It not only tells you the numbers, it tells you in order, rather than some of the other mnemonics that are kind of random. All right, so then the C1 and C2, also known as the atlas and axis. So these are the first two vertebrae of the cervical column or cervical region of your vertebral column. So this is the atlas and it fits on the axis. And this is kind of like a picture. So I like this picture because it shows you that the atlas actually shows you the ligament that connects this. So the atlas and axis aren't just like jig jiggling around this post called the dens in the ac axis. It actually is held in place by connective tissue. So it's not just bone. This connective tissue is very important. Otherwise that dens in the at axis or do actually like jiggle around in the atlas like this. But the cool thing about atlas and axis, it allows the at that dens allows the axis to pivot. So this is why you have the atlas and axis. So this when you when you do that, when this atlas rotates around this dens, it's kind of like a post that pivots. So when you move your head and shake it nose left and right, this is what is causing or actually supporting that movement. So by rotating on that dens, this allows you to rotate your head left and right. So this is called the transverse ligament. Hey, anatomical directions, right? And planes. So this is the superior articular surface. Remember, articulate means a term where a bone touches another bone. So this is the one that touches, hey, what's sitting upon the C1 right here? Your skull, right? And more specifically, the occipital bone of your skull. And even more specifically, the occipital condyle. So you, again, if you have two bones touching, you want that surface to be kind of smooth. So this is why you have a smooth facet right here with the superior articular surface. So again, the occipital condyles, that fits on there. So Atlas, you, I mean, everyone's kind of knows, like if you're in high school, like I think everyone has to read Atlas Shrugs. You know Atlas holding up the world. But again, instead of Atlas holding up the world in your Atlas in your body, in your vertebral column, the atlas is holding up your big globe, your big skull. So again, where is it holding it? More all than your occipital condyles. Then axis. So when you have an axis, again, this is the axis referring to rotation. This is a central line around which something rotates. So here we have the axis of the earth. Here we're in this top, we have an axis right here. And like if you've seen like the Olympics and when they spin, when the skier spins, they spin along an axis. So some sort of imaginary line around which something rotates. Same with the axis in your C2. So this, instead of having an imaginary line, you actually have a physical structure. So this is a dens. So this is why it's called the axis. This is what your atlas pivots on. So the atlas sits on the axis and then pivots along that on the, the, that dens. And again, in this picture, we're not showing the transverse ligament, but this is the thing, the atlas spins on the axis. And now the cervical vertebrae. So this is also a common exam question, hint, hint. But this is what you're, so you're not looking from the side, you're looking actually from the superior part. So if you took a vertebrae and kind of faced it toward you and faced the top toward you, this is what you'd be looking at. So what you have are all these processes and notice that you have like a foramen, a big hole. And this is something you see only really, you only see in cervical vertebrae, a transverse foramen. So this is another re way you can determine a cervical vertebrae from your thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. And you also have the costal processes. 
So we might not have time for ribs, but when you see that term costal, that refers to the ribs. So I like to think of it this way. I like to think of the cervical vertebrae kind of looking like, a, like one of these beetles. And why? Because I think the spinous process kind of looks like this, the horn of this beetle, and these two parts are the eyes. I mean, some people, they don't like this mnemonic. So if you don't get this, don't worry. But this is how I used to, how I identify cervical vertebrae. If it reminds me of beetle, it's, I think it's cervical vertebrae. But these transverse foramen, they're a dead giveaway as well. And these don't apply to the atlas and axis. Again, these are the C1 and C2. They have the special anatomy. But the C3 through C7, they kind of look like maybe the spinous process will be really big in the C7. But they kind of have that general shape we see here in this picture. And then, so this is spinous vertebrae prominence. So as you can see, the spinous process juts out. We might get to that when we talk about joints. And then we have the vertebral column. So net right below that, we have the thoracic region. So remember, breakfast at 7, 7 cervical. And how many thoracic? Again, lunch at 12. So here we have our thoracic vertebrae. Now, this is what I won't do. I won't have the T3 by itself and the T5 vertebrae by itself and ask you which one is T3, T5, T7, T8. No, I think that's not quite fair. But things like atlas and axis that are easy to identify, I think those are fair. But what do I want you to get from this? Well, you have the thoracic vertebrae making it, supporting your thorax. And as you can see, they don't have transverse process, they don't have transverse foramina. So they don't have a hole in their transverse process or or like down here as you would see in the cervical vertebrae. But they still have a vertebral foramen. So you have and also a body. So this part where all the vertebrae kind of stack upon each other, this is the body and this vertebral, vertebral foramen, this is where your spinal cord passes through. So as you can tell, if you take the typical C3 through C7 vertebrae and compare it, you can see many differences between the two. And this is the side view. So if you're looking at someone from the side, this is what you would see. All the vertebral bodies with the discs between stacked up this way and you would see all of these lined up so processes i think the processes transverse hey that's along the transverse plane spinous process this is actually what if you run your fingers along someone's back in where their spine is this is what you would feel the bony part this forms that bony ridge you see here so again this is the spinous process this for the uh, spinous processes these form that line you can feel when you're palpating someone's back so I like to think of it this way. Compared to the, the, the beetle we saw from the front, I like to think that the thoracic vertebrae, they kind of look like a giraffe from the side. So a very long nose, and then you have the superior processes here. The, I mean, some people don't get it, but I like to think of it like it kind of looks like a giraffe. <laughs> and then you also have the ribs articulating with it as well. OK, so we have the thoracic vertebrae. And now let's go to, okay, remember the mnemonic, breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, and then dinner at 5, early dinner. So then we have our lumbar vertebrae, and there are five vertebrae. So what do you notice? Well, now the vertebral body is pretty chunky. And notice that spinous process compared to the thoracic vertebrae, notice it's not very thin and elongated. Now all these processes, actually all these processes overall, they're more chunky and robust, but think about it this way. Which part of your vertebral column is supporting more weight? Well, if you have your cervical vertebrae, they're only really supporting the other cervical vertebrae and your head, right? Whereas your thoracic vertebrae, they're supporting everything from your, che your chest up. And then your lumbar vertebrae, they're pretty much supporting the mo everything from your chest upwards, right? So again, these, this is why the vertebrae from the lumbar vertebrae are very thick and chunky because they're dealing with a lot of weight. So it makes sense to have the more robust and sturdy structures on the bottom of your vertebral column. So this is why he's an animal. So here we have a very chunky moose. And again, all these, I like to think of this as the antlers and this is like the nose of the moose. And this is, I mean, I'm not a zoologist. I don't know what you call this waddle that hangs down, but I like to think of it compared to a giraffe, it looks more chunkier and robust and thick. So moose is more, whereas a giraffe is light and slender, a moose is more chunkier and thicker. 
And this is another clue too. So if you compare the three, you notice that the vertebrae, vertebral foramen are smaller and the vertebral body is very thick. Again, remember, these, the, the body is where all these vertebrae stack upon each other. So if it's at the very bottom, it's like doing, making a, or it's like ha having a Lego structure or some, or if you're playing those party games where you try to stack things as high as you want, you want a very solid base and that's wide if you're trying to stack real high. Same with your vertebral column. Yeah, thick. Yeah, so, and then you have the sacrum and coccyx again. They start off as five and four vertebrae each, but when in adults and where when you're de developed in the womb, they start to fuse. So that's why you still see a bunch of ridges and some of these little, like, arth yeah, so this is why it kind of looks like that. All these ridges, they were part of individual vertebrae, but they ended up fusing. And then the coccyx, actually you can see the four right here. One, two, three, four. But now they've just fused into one bone. And the... So I like to think of it this way. The way I like to think of a sacrum, it kind of looks like a weird hockey mask. <laughs> and then the coccyx, it's like, well, yeah, it looks like a little tail right here. So that's the way I determined those two. Yeah, so sacrum and coccyx. So put it, putting it all together. So what we have here, a typical cervical, again, C1, C2 are special. They're the atlas and axis respectively. So we're talking about C3, 2, 3, 7 when we do this type of view and then thoracic, and then lumbar. But look at the vertebral foram foramina, the foramen, right? The little holes. So the interesting thing is that your spinal cord also starts off very thick and then tapers off to pretty thin or to, and narrows off as it goes, it goes from superior to inferior. So this foramen, which the spinal cord runs through, also correspondingly gets narrower and narrower as you go from cervical to lumbar. And let's look at the body. So let's look at the chunky part where you stack all these vertebrae on each other. So notice that as you go from superior to the bottom to inferior, as you go from cervical to thoracic to lumbar, notice that the body gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Well, that makes sense because again, as you go down the spinal column, the lower regions of your spinal column support more weight than the upper, more superior regions. So again, this is a, they're not all the same. They do have different types of structures. They're more robust and sturdier on the bottom and more thinner and more elaborate on the top. So this is how I'm able to kind of, if I, someone just gave me a vertebrae, I might not be able to tell you if it's like a T1 or T2 or T3, but I can make a good guess whether it's a cervical, thoracic, or lumbar just based on these general differences. And again, so putting it together, so this is a lumbar, thoracic and cervical. So if you like my animal mnemonic, I like to think of the sturdy moose on the bottom. And I know, okay, I know giraffes are much bigger than this, but I'd like to think of a thin giraffe on top and then the very small beetle stacked on top. So this is how I kind of use that mnemonic. But again, if you do hate the animal mnemonic, don't have to use it. And let's see, abnormal curvature. These are the only three I would, there, I would actually test you on. So you have scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis. And if you've, at least in elementary school here, or what's it, intermediate school, but if you've ever been to the nurse's office, in Hawaii, if you went to school here in Hawaii, they probably did a test where they ask you to lift, they, you go to the nurse's office, they lift up, or they ask you to lift up the back of your shirt, and they run your, their hands down your back, right? So why are they doing that? Are they just testing if you're ticklish? No, they're actually testing if you have scoliosis. They want to see, like, do you have this abnormal curvature to the to lateral curvature to your spinal column? So if you notice that it was kind of like that, then and it wasn't straight down, they might say, hey, you're at risk for scoliosis. But again, why do they test you when you're developing? Well, if you're developing and growing, you want to kind of correct that scoliosis so you don't have that crooked spine as you're growing up. And yeah, so this is why she has this, notice that this back brace isn't very symmetrical, but if she's having this S-shaped curvature to her spine, they want to correct for that. So now you can see how she looks after scoliosis correction. And actually, look at this before. Look at her left and right shoulder. Notice that they're not really even, but they're a lot more, yeah, they're more parallel to the ground and level with each other after the scoliosis treatment. Or actually, I had a friend. He has scoliosis, but it was very interesting. When he did squats, 
because he has scoliosis and was, was uncorrected, like he would actually kind of go off to the side a bit because he, his spine didn't have that abnormal lateral curvature. So yeah, scoliosis would be like that. Now, kyphosis, aka in layman's term, hunchback. But yeah, kyphosis is a medical term. So this is how I like to think of it. When someone kicks you in the stomach, how do you react? Do you go like this or do you go like that? You kind of double over, right? So this is the way I like to think of it. When you kick, get kicked and you get kicked, that's why I think of it. It's like kick starts with K. So kyphosis is like if you got kicked in the stomach or in this case lower, then you kind of double over, you hunch your back. So kyphosis refers to that forward curvature or, or actually like when you have your, for, yeah, <laughs> when it curves like that. Now lordosis and so I, this came up one year. What's the difference between lordosis and sway back? Don't worry for that about this class, but I want you to know the term lordosis. Compared to that hunchback right there, what you have here is that, notice that the, there's an extreme curvature toward here. So I'm thinking, so she's pregnant, she's up high, she's carrying. So what is she thinking? Well, if you know someone who is pregnant, they're always complaining about their back. And in fact, they might say, oh Lord, my back is killing me. So that's why I think of it. A pregnant woman, she has extreme curvature down here. It's protruding out here. This is lordosis. And do you have to be pregnant? Ooh, that's actually good. That sounds like someone's backpack question. But yeah, so this is the way I think of it. Kyphosis, aka hunchback, lordosis. This is when you, what you typically see with this extreme curvature in the lumbar region. And let's end on this. One final packback question. Or not packback, ooh, top hat question. Okay, put the following vertebral column regions in order, starting with the most superior region at the top and the most inferior at the bottom. All right, let's see how everyone did. So these are the popular responses. And the most popular order is also the correct order. So again, cervix referring to the neck or neck of something, thorax referring to the chest, lumbar referring to your lower back, then sacral and coccygeal, these are referring to your lower parts. So again, like coccygeal, your, aka your tailbone, and then sacrum is between that and your lumbar region. All right, so thank you, and sorry for the, all the technical problems with it, my connection dropping. I'm glad you stuck around, and so see you on Wednesday. I, am, I think I might finish with ribs, like, real quick before on Wednesday lecture, and then we'll start in with the appendicular skeleton that branches off from that. All right, so thank you for your patience today. I know it seems like I have to expect one technical problem per <laughs> lecture, but thank you, and stay healthy, and take care, all right? An exam score, so if you're on top hat, you can kind of see your raw score. So just take whatever your raw score is, multiply it by 50, that's your exam score.